Morant with a running start. Elevate. Oh, oh, it does. Oh, oh, my goodness. Oh. He's done. High game in overtime. Gasol will turn. into it on the floor with Randolph. Hard to tell if there are any punches being thrown under there, but Griffin took except Adams going long. Moran! Oh, he hit it! He hit it! He hit it! John Moran gets 70! You gotta be kidding me. Welcome to Grits and Grinds, a Memphis Grizzlies podcast. Grizzlies win! Edition. My name is Keith Parrish. I am here in Las Vegas. You can probably tell just based on my voice. I'm here covering the Grizzlies, and the Grizzlies opened their Las Vegas account with a big win over the Sacramento Kings. However, Zach Eady did not play in that game to the disappointment of most everyone. So, on today's episode, I'm going to talk about that game and no Zach Eady. Also, there's NBA Cup news to go over, and possibly we have some hints about the Grizzlies' upcoming city jerseys. So before we get into all that stuff on this episode, just a word from SeatGeek. SeatGeek takes the confusion out of buying tickets on the secondary market. Whatever event you're trying to go to, if they have tickets, you'll find a great deal on SeatGeek. And if you're a first-time user and use my promo code FASTBREAKBREAK, SeatGeek will give you $20 off that first purchase. You can't beat that deal. So if you want to try out SeatGeek, use my promo code FASTBREAKBREAK, same as my Twitter handle, FASTBREAKBREAK. And again, SeatGeek will give you $20 off your first purchase. All right. The Grizzlies won easily over the Kings, but the story of the game is Zach Eady still not being ready to play. I don't think anyone believes Zach Eady is seriously hurt. He quite obviously turned his ankle in that first matchup in the Utah Summer League. He returned to that game, finished that game, of course had the famous tip-in off the Jake LaRavia missed free throw, but since then still been nursing that sore ankle, and there was extreme palpable disappointment that he was not able to play in the game on Friday. The gym, the Cox Pavilion gym at UNLV was packed, and a lot of people there I mean, there are a lot of Grizzlies fans. There's always a lot of Kings fans. Kings fans travel really well to the Las Vegas Summer League, but there were a lot of Grizzlies fans. There were a lot of people wearing Purdue colors. Like, Purdue fans were there to see Zach Eady, And also, just based on the Summer League schedule, the Grizzlies only play on Friday for this entire weekend. They don't play on Saturday or Sunday. So this was a lot of people's one opportunity to see Zach Eady, and he wasn't fit enough to go. And... I think it's weird how the NBA Summer League, this has nothing to do with the Grizzlies, I think it's weird how the NBA Summer League has given some teams two days off this year. Like the Grizzlies not playing on Saturday and Sunday, a little bit odd. Like the Los Angeles Lakers, by far the biggest draw at Las Vegas Summer League, they don't play on Saturday or Sunday either. They played on Friday to an absolutely packed Thomas and Mack arena. I mean, not like completely sold out, but there were so many people there for a summer league game where the biggest draw was Bronny James. I mean, maybe Reed Shepard. Reed Shepard was incredible, by the way, as is Cam Whitmore, who maybe is looking to defend his 2023 summer league MVP. But anyways, the schedule seems kind of weird, but it's super unlucky for fans who plan to go to Vegas and maybe even booked their travel before the summer league schedule came out to like plan a weekend in Vegas because it's summer league and you want to see Zach Eady play. And then this is your one chance on Friday and he doesn't suit up. So I don't know if there's any, anything that can be done uh, about that for the Grizzlies. I do think it's worth wondering just generally like how much of a fan consideration do basketball teams ever like weigh in? I mean, it's like a bigger conversation than I even, you know, than the kind of things I normally even talk about on, on grits and grinds, but like how much does serving your fans weigh in on basketball decisions? Like you don't want someone to play through injury. Um, but it's like, if someone's beat up just a little bit like bruised and sore and it's like, Oh, this is a big home game. Let's at least take care of our season ticket holders. And you know, That's, again, a different argument as the Grizzlies did not take care of their season ticket holders last year, uh, hardly winning any home games. But I do wonder just like what the balance is as far as um, player health. Like if you think about just the human beings, the players, absolutely, 
prioritizing their health is the ethically correct thing to do at all times. If you just think about the human being, Zach Eady, or any player who's nursing an injury, hey, rest up, get better. That is probably the best thing for this person in the long run. But like, this is not a sport. The NBA is not a sport of just taking care of human beings. I mean, we like to think ethically it could be, but it's like there is some competitive aspect to the fact that, hey, we're trying to win games. Thus, oh, your knee hurts, but hey, we need to win this game. So you go and play. And then there's the aspect of this being an entertainment product. It's an inter That's all it is, you know, and you're also trying to entertain your fans and sell tickets and sell TV deals. So you want players to play. And that's where the load management issue, that's where the league came up with the player participation policy and all this stuff. So there's all these different factors uh, that you weigh in. And I just think it's interesting when it comes to Zach Eady specifically and his circumstances this summer. And I did not mean to go on a rant um, to start this up. We'll talk about uh, Jake LaRavia uh, having six steals in just a second. Um, but I think the Edie question is particularly interesting because it's one of those things where there are so many disappointed fans. But also when you think about like what's best for Zach Eady basketball-wise. Long-term for his career, if he has a sore ankle, he's a big man. Obviously, lower body issues with big men, you want to be super careful with. Um, but you think about like, what's the best path to get better just as a basketball player if he has a competitive window of playing for like a, a decade. And I think it's also interesting when I talk to um, Team Canada basketball fans who are pretty sore about him not being like on Team Canada and then also not playing in Summer League. And I think it's a funny question. You're like, all right, what's best for Zach Eady as uh, the human being? Resting, obviously better than probably playing through uh, any kind of injury. What's better for Zach Eady's basketball career? I don't think it's as clear cut saying holding him out of summer league is the best thing for his career necessarily. Would this risk injury or re-aggravation? That's where you have to ask a doctor and I don't know, but like what's better for Zach Eady's basketball career or what's the best way for him to get better as a basketball player. When you think about the national team aspect of this, like, is it better for Zach Eady's basketball career and getting better? Like what's, what's more beneficial to him representing his country in competitive like high stakes international basketball games at the Olympics where he's going against literally the best centers in the world or being held out for precautionary reasons at summer league. I think you could make an argument going and playing Joel Embiid and Nikola Jokic and you know, all the other great centers across the world that might be actually more beneficial to him becoming the best basketball player he can be. I don't know how much that factors in, and again, you fall back to the, we want to prioritize health, the biggest thing. And if you think just about specifically the Grizzlies world, unrelated to Zach Eady, when you think about the Grizzlies, their priority to win a championship, healthy Zach Eady, and you'd prefer maybe to have him under your watchful eye as opposed to having him playing for the national team. But anyways, whew, that went a different direction than I was thinking about. But no Zach Eady. Everyone was sad. As far as the actual basketball game, the Grizzlies won comfortably, like I said. They were up a ton at halftime. Then in the second half, things really fell apart. Like, this was a super ragged, ugly basketball game. You highlight the steals. We're like, whoa, Jake LaRavia had six steals. Awesome. Scotty Pippen Jr. had five steals. Awesome. Yeah, those are great numbers. And then if you flip it around from, like, the Kings side, you say, wait a minute, the Kings had 31 turnovers? 31 turnovers in a basketball game is preposterous. Um, it's been 24 years since an NBA team in a regular season game turned the basketball over 31 times. So these are like, these are horrible numbers. Um, the Kings had 31 fouls and 31 turnovers. The Grizzlies got 20 steals. And again, good job, uh, Isaiah Miller and Gigi Jackson and, you know, Scottie Pippen and Jake LaRavia with your defense. But also there's some culpability on the Kings of like, whoo, they were very bad. Um, for purposes of illustration, in the Grizzlies' regular season history, they've only gotten 20 or more steals once. Uh, they had 22. Their franchise record for steals in a game was back in 2010. So the Grizzlies getting 20 steals, an absolute wild number. Uh, they had eight steals in the first quarter. Uh, the Kings could not stop turning the basketball over. Because of that, the Grizzlies had a lot of fast break points and the Kings had hardly any. So the Grizzlies built, again, built this big lead because of all the turnovers. Then in the third quarter, this thing, if you were watching it, it really started to slow down. And this is when all the fouling started occurring. 
The Grizzlies in the third quarter only made five out of their 18 field goal attempts, but got to the foul line 14 times, made 13 out of 14 free throws in just the third quarter. There were 22 combined fouls in just the third quarter. So like, you know, good win for the Grizzlies. Hey, you win by 20. You score over 100 points in a summer league game. That's great. But it also was not what I would call a very entertaining basketball game. Like there weren't even that many great highlights. I feel like the most exciting moments were, it's probably Cam Spencer hitting his pull-up threes. He had a four-point play where he hit back-to-back threes. And it's like, that was probably the biggest highlight of the game. The most excited the gym was. Other than that, it was just free throws and turnovers and it was uh, also a pretty long game. I feel like the Grizzlies summer league games have all run very long. I mean, they only allot them. I mean, that not that much time, you know, like they're scheduled, I think every two hours, like the Grizzlies game took legitimately two hours. It's not supposed to take the entire full two hours um, usually, but for whatever reason, all these Grizzlies summer league games so far have really drug out. Uh, maybe you, you credit the scrappiness of the, of the Grizzlies defense because the Grizzlies are good at defense. The Grizzlies have more talent than their opponents a lot of the times. So that was certainly the case against the Kings. There were times where you had four guys on the court who uh, shared the court for the Grizzlies regular season team, you know, last year, where you had Scottie Pippen Jr., Gigi Jackson, Jake LaRavia, and Trey Jemison. Those guys played on the real Grizzlies last year, and they played a lot of minutes. By the way, Trey Jemison, of course, started um, for Zach Eady. But I guess we can now talk just more about the player performances. Jake LaRavia led the way, 22 points, those eye-popping six steals, four rebounds, two assists, five turnovers. Continues to look like a very just strong, comfortable third-year player. That's what you want to see from your veterans. And, of course, he only has you know very few actual regular season games under his belt. I believe it's 70 is the total number, but you're liking what you're seeing from Jake. He continues to play with physicality. He's really good at grifting for fouls. We've seen that in the regular season. I do think maybe like he is working his way up the depth chart. I think when we think about the Grizzlies for next year, a lot of times we pencil in like Gigi Jackson over Jake LaRavia. And I feel like Jake might actually be the better option a lot of the times. I know that might be heresy to a lot of people. Um, Gigi wasn't bad at all. I mean, it wasn't an amazing game. He uh, had 17 points. It did take him 17 field goal attempts to get there. He was just two out of nine on his two pointers. But Gigi, I mean, he's still 19. It is always worth repeating, I feel like, especially even in summer league. He's still one of the younger guys who's even playing. Um, So he had 17. He did make three out of eight threes, a couple of deep pull-ups from the top of the key. Also, speaking of pull-ups, uh, the Grizzlies also in this game, they had 14 assists. Okay, that's not very many. That's extremely few. They scored 103 points and had 14 assists. A lot of that's the fouls. You know, you can't get an assist when you get fouled on the shot and don't make it. So they hit a ton of free throws. Um, they were, what, 89% from the line with 30 makes. But 14 assists is a very low number. So there was a lot of unassisted baskets going on. And um, I don't know, maybe that just overall caused some of the reason the game wasn't that much fun to watch, in my opinion. Um, Scotty Pippen Jr. continues looking strong out there. 16 points, four assists, got those five steals, three rebounds, four out of nine on field goal attempts, which is relatively efficient for this Grizzlies Summer League squad. He had six fouls. I think he was five of them in the first half. Nice work there. So Cam Spencer also started. Um, so the starters, I guess I should clearly say it. Uh, Gigi Jackson. Jake LaRavia, Scotty Pippen Jr., Cam Spencer, and Trey Jemison. Cam Spencer, really nice game. I already said he had maybe the highlight of the game with the back-to-back three-pointers. But Cam scores 15 points. He makes six out of nine field goal attempts. Hits those three threes. He has four assists, three rebounds, three steals, eight fouls. Now, that's impressive. But uh, Cam Spencer looking really, really good out there. Now, his second-round rookie teammate, Jalen Wells, he came off the bench. Very forgettable game for Jalen Wells. He was largely invisible out there. He scored once early, and that was the only basket of the game. He had six points, made all four of his free throws. Um, He missed all three of his three-point attempts. So not exactly what you were hoping to see from the 39th pick. As far as the other bench players, the only other guys who played kind of any significant minutes were Isaiah Miller and Dickie Giroux. Isaiah Miller played well. He had three steals 
of the Grizzlies, 20, uh, scored eight points. He did not take any three-pointers, so like maybe that just helps his overall field goal percentage because he hasn't been making them. But uh, he had, what, three out of six from the field. Dickey had 11 points. He was always pushing the ball in transition, got several driving layups. That's what he does. Also, four rebounds and a steal. Timmy Allen also played, but he only got in for the final two minutes of garbage time. So, I mean, maybe I'm being picky with my basketball aesthetics, calling a 20-point win kind of hard to watch. But, I mean, 31 turnovers and 31 personal fouls is stunning. Or 31 team fouls for the Kings is such a horrible number. And the Grizzlies not shooting the ball particularly well, not really having that many highlights. It wasn't the most fun. Like, people I talked to at Summer League who were in the other gym watching Bronny James, they were like, hey, how was the Grizzlies game? And I always led with, the Kings had 31 turnovers. (laughs) And they all were like, whoa. Uh, So, yeah, the Kings were awful. Maybe the Grizzlies will play some uh, better teams coming up. They play the Mavericks on Monday. Fingers crossed. I would say the big expectation is Zach Eadie is going to play in that game on Monday. But um, who knows? Uh, Hopefully, we can just cross our fingers anyways um let's take a real quick break and then i'm going to come back and talk about the in-season tournament oh i'm sorry the nba cup uh groups that were announced i'm going to talk about the grizzlies coaching staff and the polos they were wearing and what that might tell us maybe about some upcoming city jerseys and also we have to mention luke Kennard every episode so we'll do that right after this short break All right, let's continue our team-issued clothing watch. Started on last episode talking about the team-issued Vancouver Grizzlies gear being worn by players on the bench. We know the upcoming season is the 30th anniversary of the Grizzlies franchise, and thus we're expecting the Vancouver Grizzlies throwbacks this coming season. Um, Now, for the game against the Kings, the first game at Summer League in Vegas, the coaching staff were all wearing these polo shirts that had a Memphis Sounds 50th anniversary logo. I mean, I think this is another hint about maybe what the jerseys are going to look like this upcoming season. The logos, they did not have any color on them. This was a black and white logo on these shirts. But the recognition of the Memphis Sounds, who were the ABA franchise back in uh, one season, 1974-75, They've been honored before. You remember the red jerseys. The players I most associate with those jerseys are Vince Carter and Mario Chalmers for whatever reason. I guess like Mike and Mark, I remember more in the regular jerseys. But um, we had those red throwbacks, I think, eight seasons ago. And maybe this is a hint at what the city jersey could be. Because if you remember, there was this Reddit post a month or two ago where someone claimed they'd seen all the designs for the upcoming city jerseys for every team, and they said the Grizzlies jersey was going to be red. And I thought maybe that was going to be some kind of weird Vancouver throwback, kind of like the Mitchell and Ness red Grizzlies jerseys they've done. But also, you know, I think most people's thoughts for that was, oh, yeah, like the Sounds jerseys they had. So now we see the coaching staff wearing Sounds shirts for the 50th anniversary I'm starting to connect those dots. And again, this is just reckless speculation. Not reckless. No one's getting hurt here. But uh, it seems like that could be a hint that for the city jerseys this year, it might be in recognition of the Memphis Sounds and that 50th anniversary. And then, of course, for the NBA Cup, that could mean we get a wild or bold court design. Like if the Grizzlies are wearing red ABA jerseys, maybe they'll do some kind of throwback Court design, because you remember you always had these weird and wild court designs last year that were not universally loved. I mean, I thought many of them were hideous looking and hard to watch on television. But maybe, again, if we're doing sounds jerseys for the city jersey, and if that's the court design is going to be based off of that, we could see something pretty fun. So that's just something I was thinking about. Now, as far as the actual... NBA Cup and the groups that were announced on Friday, the Grizzlies ended up in a very tough squad. I feel like last year I said the Grizzlies were in the group of death. That might have been some fan bias. This year, there's no question. They are in the group of death. Like if you look at the West, I think five of the nine best teams in the West are in this group with the Grizzlies. The Grizzlies group is them plus Denver, 
Dallas, New Orleans, and Golden State. All right, Denver and Dallas are two of the favorites in the West. If you look at like betting odds to win the Western Conference next year, the Warriors are 16 to 1, the Grizzlies and Pelicans are both 20 to 1. So just based on like gambling lines, that's five of the best nine teams in the West are in one group. Uh, that's that's a tough draw. Like you think, all right, the Jazz are probably the worst team. Maybe the Blazers um, this upcoming season, just because the Jazz might trade Larry Markin and really tank out. But like most people accept Jazz, Spurs, Blazers, Rockets, maybe a tier down from the other teams. I mean, the Spurs, Rockets could be good. We don't really know. But like not getting any of those teams in your group is kind of tough. And the way this ended up was because it's based on your it's a draw based on your record from last year. And the Grizzlies had a horrible record from last year. So they're in like the weaker pool. And so it's actually bad luck for like the Mavericks and Nuggets more than it is for the Grizzlies, where it's like you knew the Grizzlies draw was going to be tough no matter what, because they were going to be considered one of the bad teams as far as the draw, the way it worked. But turns out very tough group for the Grizzlies. Not that it really matters. Um, anyways, finally, the every episode mention of Luke Kennard. Here's what I'm gathering. Here is what the expectation seems to be if you talk to anybody. Uh, the Grizzlies are going to sign Luke Kennard. That's what everyone's been saying. I'm just repeating it once again. How or when it's going to happen, it seems like the Grizzlies are waiting until they can clear up some more space under the luxury tax line. Could they re-sign Luke Kennard and go into the tax? Of course they could. Will they? No. Um, they are going to dump some salary, we think. That is maybe, again, a general feeling people have is that there's going to be a salary dump. Now, how will they shed this salary? I don't know. Whose salary are they shedding? I think that one you can probably figure out. They are pretty close to the luxury tax line right now. If they got, say, oh, I don't know, like $6 million further from the luxury tax line, they could probably pay Luke Kennard something that his agent would be cool with. So which players make $6 million a year? Well, there's a couple. And there's one, I think, more likely to move than the other. So I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know if that's, this is actually the path that's going to occur. But like, it feels like Zaire Williams is the dead man walking, um, to put my finger on it. Like, I don't know how I feel about that, honestly, because like Zaire is still 22, the same age as Dalton Connect and other guys playing in Summer League. Of course, he's in the last year of his rookie deal. Of course, Gigi Jackson's ahead of him in the depth chart. Jake LaRavia is ahead of him in the depth chart, not to even mention like Vince Williams Jr. But still, like, I don't mind having a 22-year-old 10th man or 12th man or something. But it seems like the priority could be they got to get further away from the luxury tax in their, in their words, not my words. Um, they want to get further away from luxury tax to then re-sign Luke Kennard. If it's a straight salary dump, which I don't know how that would occur, or if any team would just take a flyer on him for free, it feels unlikely, then at least you would have another roster spot open up if you sign Luke Kennard. But then you still have the same issue of like, well, if you don't want to go into the tax, can you get another minimum body in? Are you going to get a minimum big? I mean, maybe you could theoretically trade Zaire for a big on the minimum. Even someone who's not on the minimum who's been like linked to the Grizzlies before, like if you did a Zaire Williams for Daron Sharp trade and sent the Nets several second round picks, well, that doesn't save you enough money in my mind. That only saves you $2 million right there. That's not enough, I don't think, to keep Luke Kennard if you're going to sign him to like $8 million or more a season. So I don't know. Um, if they do, in fact, like say get rid of Zaire and then sign Luke Kennard, then it's, all right, we saw 14 players. Are they going to use the 15th roster spot? Will they keep it open for the time being until maybe they can figure out a way to create even more cap space? But that's just uh, maybe kind of the the word on what we're thinking is going to occur with the Grizzlies and their regular roster. And with that, I think we can wrap up the episode. Good win for the summer, Grizzlies. Uh, Jake LaRavia keeps looking really good. Scotty Pippen Jr. keeps looking really good. Gigi Jackson, I think our expectations are possibly higher. We want to see him maybe look like he's on this all-star trajectory, even though he's still so young. I mean, last year, Summer League, he wasn't good. You know, he showed some flashes of the athleticism, but, like, he couldn't play team basketball. And this year, he is playing team basketball, but just the efficiency still isn't there. And it would be great to see him just, like, absolutely dominate a game. You know, like, go out and be like, listen, I played a lot of NBA games last season. I scored a lot of points. I had a lot of big scoring games. So in Summer League, I'm just going to light it up one game. 
and people are going to be talking all around the arena like, oh man, did you hear about what Gigi Jackson did? So I think our expectations are just much higher for Gigi. So because of that, the reviews so far are maybe middling. We are like, yeah, it's been fine. But I, I kind of hoped for even better. And then um, Cam Spencer, I mean, he's just been really good. And he's been so consistent. And consistency is just such a, it's honestly a rare thing to see from players in summer league. So hopefully see more of that. And then hopefully Jalen Wells will um, pop in the upcoming final summer league games. And then Zach Eady, come on back, brother. We want to watch you play so bad. Anyways, thanks you guys for listening. If you want to support this show, if you want to get access to my Grizzlies Slack channel where I talk about the Grizzlies around the clock with the other listeners and supporters, you can do that at patreon.com slash fast break breakfast. All right. Hope you guys have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Go Grizz.